okay, so how do we make capitalism sustainable? What does sustainable mean? What does the word mean? Make it last. I don't think you have to make capitalism sustainable. I think it is, right? Once we embrace it and are committed to it, then it's the most sustainable system in human history. What makes capitalism sustainable is the fact that it is constantly producing profits. Those profits are constantly reinvested into the capitalist system, and it's constantly growing and growing and growing. There's no cap. There's no limit on human growth. There's no limit on how far that process can happen. There's nothing that makes it unsustainable. You know, people say, yeah, but you run out of, I don't know, resources. But, but we never do. Why don't we run out of uh, resources? Like, let's say, let's say over the next 30 years, we run out of, let's say we run out of, uh, I don't want to use oil because that's too much of a, uh, what's something we use every day? Paper. Oh, how you run out of paper? God. I mean, let's say you run out of paper. We lose some of the technology to make paper. I don't know why, because trees are still going to be there, right? So we run out of paper. So what do we do? Do we? Yeah. Yeah, somebody would innovate a way for us to write on, and they already have, right? You can write on your computer. You can write on a digital screen. Or you would make paper for something other than trees or whatever it is that makes it possible to make paper right now. The only limitation on resources is the human mind, human imagination, human innovation. Human, that's it. There's nothing unsustainable about capitalism. Indeed, our, our wanting to restrict capitalism makes our economies unsustainable. What is unsustainable is socialism. As Margaret Thatcher said, socialism very quickly runs out of other people's money to redistribute. Because it's all about redistribution of money from some people to other. At some point, these people are going to run out. You won't have anything to redistribute. But capitalism is a self-perpetuating machine because it's constantly creating wealth out of nothing. That's the beauty of it, right? I mean, this is out of nothing. I mean, it's got millions of components, but every one of those components by itself is worthless. It's the integration of them into this thing which created wealth that didn't exist before, created utility that didn't exist before. And we constantly are making stuff like this, and we have been for thousands of years. That's the perpetuation, and for that you need capitalism. Yeah? What's your opinion on anti-monopoly laws and the monopolies of the competition? So what do I think of anti-monopoly laws? I think monopoly stifle well, competition. I think the anti-monopoly laws are probably the most immoral laws we have in the books. If I were ever put in a position of power, which I never will be, so don't worry, I would eliminate anti-monopoly laws probably first. Uh, this is how anti-monopoly laws work. And if there are any lawyers in the room, they can either confirm or deny what I'm about to say. Right? If, um, if you uh, charge a very high price, and you have a big profit motive, pro profit um, margin. You're a monopolist because if you weren't a monopolist, then you know you couldn't charge a big profit margin because if you take an economic 101, which about a third of is useless stuff you teach that you learn. Um, sorry, econ professors, but it's reality. Uh, the whole section on perfect competition and monopoly should be scrapped from every textbook in the books because it's absolutely 100% useless, completely useless, because this is what they teach. If you make a big, a big profit margin, you must be a monopolist. And therefore, we go after you, anti-competitive laws, we, 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 we prosecute you. If you price your product below your competitors significantly, then what are you doing? You're dumping, you know, you, 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 I forget the technical term, uh, you know, predatory pricing. You're predatory pricing. And we go after you with anti-monopoly laws. You're trying to grab, uh, grab market share uh, illegitimately. Right? And if you price your product at exactly the same price as your competitor, what's the problem with that? You're obviously colluding. And we go after you with anti anti-competitive laws are laws that can be applied to every single business in the United States at any given point in time at the complete discretion of the bureaucrat in charge. 
Right now, we have Lena Khan, who is hates business, broadly hates business, believes in the model of perfect competition, which is the most bizarre, detached from reality model ever invented by economists. And therefore, she's going after every business in the world. She's going after everybody big because, you know, why waste time on small stuff? She's going after everybody. And every time she goes after somebody anti-competitive, she comes up with a different excuse on why. But the reality is there's always competition in a free market. Now, granted, our market is not that free, but in a free market. If you, if you price your products, quote, too high, what will happen? People will enter the market. There's a huge profit opportunity. And they'll grab market share from you. And there'll be competition. Even if there's no competition today, they will raise venture capital and they will grab it. Why doesn't Google charge you for search? Google, Google for antitrust reasons, which is bizarre, right? Because how much do you pay for search? Zero. So who's exactly suffering from the Google monopoly over search? Not us. People who advertise may be paying too high advertising rates. We're trying to protect them, the advertisers. That's who we're trying to protect. Why do we care? And advertising, you can advertise on television, on radio. You can advertise on a number of different websites and different places. Google doesn't dominate the advertising space. But why doesn't Google charge you for search? Because if they started charging for search, what would you do? You'd immediately go to Bing or ChatGPT, which is going to eat Google alive anyway, right? Or the Google version of ChatGPT. There's no way that Google can afford to charge for search and not lose huge amounts of customers to its non-existent competitors. We're told they don't have competition for search, but suddenly the competitors will show up, believe me. You know, a, a great example of this is in 1870s, 1870s, um, Rockefeller, Standard Oil, had 92% of the oil refining capacity in the United States. 92%. If ever there's been a, quote, monopolist, this is it. Right? Now, what does your economic theory tell you that he should have done while he was a monopolist? What would happen to prices? You owe 92% of a product segment. What do you do to prices? They go up, down, or stay the same? Up. What happens to quality when you have a monopolist? It goes down. Go look at the data. Every year it went down, prices. Every year quality went up. Dramatically, not a little bit. Why? Two reasons. Rockefeller understood that if he did not lower prices, competitors would enter the market and take his 92%. And second, he realized that the more he lowered prices, the more uses oil would serve. The cheaper it became, the more ubiquitous it would become in our culture. And indeed, by the time the internal combustion engine came around, and there were competitions for what would fuel the automobile, oil was so cheap that it was an obvious choice. It didn't have to be that way, but that was Rockefeller's genius. Who ultimately competed Rockefeller out of his business? Because there was one business, what, what was in 1870s, what was oil being used for? 90% of the use for oil in 1870 was for what? Trains? No, trains were using coal. Wood. I think he wood before coal. Well, lighting. It was used for lighting. And by the way, this is how to remember, right? Rockefeller saved the whales. Rockefeller saved the whales because before they used oil for lighting, they used whale oil for lighting. But because he made oil so cheap, it was, it was inefficient to go out and kill whales to get their whale oil because you could get kerosene. It was called kerosene to light everything you needed. It became so cheap that everybody, for the first time in all of human history, everybody, including the poor, had the ability to light their homes. Who competed who competed him out of that business? Electricity. Thomas Edison. Now, what bureaucrat would have expected that? What, what circuit judge 
would have expected competition to come from somewhere completely different. Not from the oil industry, but from an innovator who is in inventing how to use electricity to light a light bulb. But that's the reality. Indeed, by the time Rockefeller's oil company was broken up by anti-competitive monopoly laws, he only had 25% of the oil industry because so many competitors had arisen in the years in between. So there was always competition there. It was just a question of the opportunity for them to assert themselves. So I would get rid of it completely. I don't believe monopolies exist in a free market. The only real monopolies are monopolies granted by government, protected by government, that can use force to exclude competition like the post office in the United States. By delivering first class mail in the US and you will go to jail. That is a monopoly. But there's no such thing as free market monopolies. They just don't exist because there's always competition. 